I was involved in gangland activities. In fact, uh, one of my friends was clubbed to death, another was thrown off a building. So I went through lots of violence. It got so bad I was running on brothel, feed the money back into the system. Uh, yeah, I was involved in some of the major crimes. Today, Dominic Yeo stands up to speak truth and help others, but his emergence into the light took a journey through darkness. Dominic, I want to talk about uh, the radical transformation mm -hmm. that took place in your life as a young man. Right. How that God, as you say, totally changed your life. Radical. Yep. But before we do, your story. Mm -hmm. Where does your story begin? Where did you live? What was it like for Dominic growing up as a young man? Well, what happened was that um, I grew up in a family of six siblings, so, you know, it's like when there's food, we have to fight for our food. Yeah, you've got to fight for your attention. So uh, I remember one time um, uh, my eldest brother came home and he was looking for his stuff and he opened my drawer and I came back just at the right time to see him searching through my stuff and, and we got into a big fight. And uh, in the whole ensuing fight, I went to a kitchen to get a chopper because I was just filled with rage. Even, even at that age, I was probably about 14 years old, filled with lots of rage. And uh, I kind of chased him around at home with a chopper. My mom came in and tried to intervene and I pushed my mom and I, I hit her. So dad came home and she told my dad, my dad has never laid a hands on me. Uh, you know, my dad was one of those silent Asian men that would belt you. But I was never, I was never struck, struck by my dad at all. But that day, he hit me. And so I decided to pack up and I left home. So I, I, I started living on the street. And I met a guy that helped me out by giving me a place of refuge to stay at his home but that means that I have to do stuff for him. So some of the stuff that I did was to peddle drugs, uh, sell pornographic materials so that I could still stay in school. And yet I was being helped by this man to do some of the stuff that he, he was doing. And um, yeah, so that got me into a, a life of vice and crime. Before age 14, any connection at all or experience with God or religion in any way? Yeah, I grew up as a Catholic, so yeah, I was one of those that grew up as Catholic. I mean, I was a good altar boy, <laughs> you know, but um, you know, you're going through those rites and rituals, but you never really have a relationship with God. I mean, you think you have, you know, at, I mean, at least for me, I thought I had, but no, I mean, I was far from God. In school, you said that you were a high school or a public school dropout. Yeah, I got involved with the wrong group of friends, I guess. Uh, then that got me into the vice, but that also got me into gang. And so I got into a, a triad. Now, at those days in Singapore, uh, if you are caught for gangsterism, they have an act called Section 55, a penal code. And we are caught under this penal code you will be arrested, incarcerated without trial. Yeah. Mm. So, and yet despite that penal code, I was involved in gangland activities. In fact, um, one of my friends was clubbed to death, another was thrown off a building. Yeah, I myself, I mean, I was clubbed. As a result, I have this, uh, this, this bone structure uh, that resulted from, from a, a steel pole crushing my skull uh, when I was about f maybe 15, 16 years old. So as a teenager, lots yeah. of violence. Yeah, lots of violence. So I went through lots of violence. And the worst part of it was that I, I learned Taekwondo. So that helps me to, f you know, fend for myself, but yet at the same time, just use that to just bully 
intimidate so that you can climb up the ranks. So, yeah. at um, at age fourteen, you were invited to a Methodist church and made somewhat of a commitment to Jesus Christ. But yes, it, it didn't last. In fact, yeah, that was kind of strange because uh, in the midst of all this, I was brought to a Methodist church and I was in a Bible study and I kind of got closer to God, but. Um, I, I guess I was still far from God, even though I made a commitment. But really, you need somebody to also disciple you through. Mm. Yeah. So I reckon, number one, I may have had an encounter with God at that time, but I didn't have someone to walk me through my Christian faith. Mm. Yeah. And so I went back into the life of vice. So you went back into that life. Now, yeah. You say that life got really bad. Like, yes. how bad did it get? Uh, yeah, it got so bad I was running a brothel. So uh, they would take girls from Thailand and, and those places, and I would kind of run that brothel, uh, feed the money back into the system. Uh, yeah, I was involved in some of the major crimes issues. Did you ever get caught by the law? Any prison time? No. Uh, I remember one time when the police came and raided the place, uh, I took off and I hid in a library, the National Library in Singapore. The rest of them were, were caught. Um, you know, when I was hiding there, I did pray to God, <laughs> that God, if you're real, save me. And uh, I mean, He proved Himself by saving me, but I never committed my end of the bargain <laughs> that I would you know, walk with him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, as, as all that life of crime and vice is going on, at age 19, yeah. you were invited to a crusade. And, and you say that you went to that crusade, you had this chip on your shoulder. It was a bad attitude, and you expressed that. Yeah. Tell me why, but then also something happened that night. Yes. Um, you know, I, I, had, I had a group of close friends, and at 19 years old, I discovered that those group of close friends were invited to this good friend of mine to his birthday party. But I wasn't given an invitation, and I was angry. The interesting thing was two weeks prior to this date, a friend of, a Christian friend invited me to a public meeting. I turned him down, and I said no, because I was waiting for the invitation to this birthday bash yeah. that never did come. Mm -hmm. So because it never did came, I decided to call this Christian guy and say, hey, I'm free, you know, take me to this. And so I went with this thing like, come on, you know, religion is for the weak, this can be real. And yet, in many ways, God has saved me many times when I say, God, if you're real, save me. And so I went into this public meeting and uh, I mean, I, I went that night not in the most sober state <laughs> because I was high on drugs, high on alcohol, and I, I mean, my hair was uh, right down to this level with chokers, bangles. I walked in and, um, yeah, you could see, uh, you know, that I looked like an oddball in the midst of everything. Mm -hmm. But I discovered one thing. The girls were really beautiful. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, trying to get a hold of their phone numbers, and then an usher wanted to take me out of the meeting. Because you were so, causing a disturbance. Yeah, I was causing a, a, a ruckus. And then this American preacher came on stage, and he said to everybody, please leave this young man alone. And I was stunned like, hey, yeah, he's a good dude. Yeah, so, so they left me, and um, we sat there, and he kind of caught my attention. Yeah, because I felt that at least there's somebody who's on my side. Yeah, and uh, he preached a message about God's love. He preached about God's love is so great, He will create barriers to keep you from hell. Uh, I listened to the whole sermon, and I knew there is a God who loved me, a God that could give me a second chance. And so when he made the altar call, I mean, I was the f one of the first, if not the first, that ran to the altars that night. Uh, now remember, I was, I, I was 
high on drugs and alcohol, but somehow I was able to listen to the sermon for whatever reason. I went out to the altar call and an uh, amazing thing happened. I was free from drug addiction that night. How do you know? That whole sensation of the addiction left. There was like a burden that was lifted. I, I, I can tell you, Bob, I skipped all the way to the home of the guy that was helping me. I packed up immediately. I immediately, you know, it's, it's like day and night. Suddenly I knew what I was doing was not right. Suddenly understanding and insight came into my life and I told myself, I have to leave this place and go back home and reconcile with my parents. And when you went home, how was that reconciliation? Yeah. Well, that's another fiasco. When I went home, I rang the bell, Mom came out and she was happy to see me back home. And, uh, and so Dad was happy to see me, they hugged me, and then Mom asked me, why, what made you come home? And I said, Jesus. And that created a ruckus. Mm. Uh, she threw my bag out of the, the gate um, uh, because we came from a, a, a Catholic, uh, but it's not truly, it's pretty synchristic, uh, let me put it. Uh, on one hand, we were pretty Catholic in, in how we believe that uh, Catholics should not go to a Protestant church and, you know, and yet on the other side, Dad was trying to cover all bases to make sure that we get to paradise. You know, get to heaven, so, uh, you know, different gods. Uh, but mom threw me out of the house. Uh, Dad took my bag, brought me back in. And uh, my mom said to me, you're no longer my son unless you give up Jesus. And, yeah, and that was a painful time because, uh, I mean, I love my mom, but I just couldn't give up Jesus. And I said to her, there's no way I could give up Jesus. So she kind of allowed me to come into the home on certain conditions. I and mean, one of those conditions is that I gave up Christ. The second condition that if I do not give up Christ, I cannot eat at the, the family table. Yeah. So it was a pretty tough time. And I remember saying this, Lord, forgive her because she doesn't know what she was saying. And I didn't know that Jesus said the same prayer when Jesus says, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they were doing. And so I kind of articulated some of the prayers that Jesus prayed that, that, uh, that night. And um, bit by bit, the love of God began to change her heart. And today, mom's in my church. You know, you mentioned earlier about the anger. Yeah. When, when you gave your life to Christ that night and you were free, things changed. Yeah. What about the anger? You know, part of the anger God took away but the other part of it, you learn to now redirect negative force into positive results. Yeah. I, you know, God gave me the ability to control temperament, to harness it for His glory. And so that, you know, I have, I have learned to transform anger into strength. I learned to transform anger uh, into, into uh, what I would call uh, a positive force. Yeah, so, so like most people, they get tired. I learned to change that into strength so that I don't need to get tired. I can continue to do stuff. Yeah, so to me, it's positive. But that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You mentioned that, um, and I heard you make a, a statement when you were preaching um, that you got saved, but then you would backslide, and then you'd backslide again. Oh, yeah. But you knew that God loved you. Yes. So how did you know that God loved you? Well, you know, let, let me share a couple of things with you. After I got radically saved from that experience at the crusade on June the 9th, 1980, I still remember, on the 10th of June, 1980, I walked into church for the first time an Assemblies of God Church. And I went to church, there was the parting of the Red Sea. I kid you not, because the moment I sat down, everybody sat a couple of <laughs> seats away from me. Uh, I looked really strange, but I got saved radically the night before. 
cleared of drug addiction. I didn't even go through cold turkey treatment. So that in itself shows me that God loves me because remember the sermon was God loves you, barriers from hell. And I knew God loves me enough to just remove all those stuff. Next day when I was in church, when folks move away from me, you would get angry. But I didn't. I just like, all right, that's fine. But I'm here for, for Jesus. So that didn't bother me. It didn't even bother me when a person said to me, shouldn't wear jeans to church. You know, in those days, it was weird. They said, shouldn't wear... And of course, I was wearing a pair of holy jeans. Holes. <laughs> and, and I wasn't angry with that guy. You see, if pre-conversion, I would have smacked him in his face. But I just looked at him, smiled, and I went on. At the altar, um, the pastor came. Dr. Naomi Dowdish came. She gave me a hug. And she says, you know, if any time you need me, we will be here for you. I felt the love of God right that instant again. Now, because of my turbulent youth, I went through this up and down. And so I backslidden a little. But in all those times, even when I, when I was in a backslidden stage, God brought people into my life to tell me God loves you keep coming back to church. Mm. And so I had I had about four four of these folks that continued to hold my hands through my journey of faith, reminding me each time God loves me. Mm. And and when you recollect the interventions of God, it these are all distinct mark of how God truly is a God of love. Now eventually you became the pastor of that church. But I want to quote this, and correct me if I'm incorrect, but I found where it's written that you did not look any bit of a leader or a pastor when you first came to Trinity. But obviously, God had a plan. God had a purpose. God worked in your life. So tell me, when did Dominic know that God was calling him into full-time vocational ministry? How did that happen? Well, that's interesting because remember that night when I gave my life to Jesus on June the 9th, 1980, when I ran down to the altar, gave my life to Jesus, immediately after saying that prayer, I said this to the Lord, whatever you want me to do, I will do. Wherever you want to send me, I will go. Years later, three, four years later, I'm right now studying the Bible. I come to this passage in Isaiah, and Isaiah says this, I will go. That hit me like a ton of brick, because suddenly I realize I have a call, just like Isaiah did. Now, I may not have looked like a Christian or even a pastor in those days, because when I first came in, long hair, bangles and all that. But you know what? The thing about the love of God is that the love of God transforms you. I don't need nobody to tell me, remove those kind of stuff, change your dress code. I didn't, I didn't dress so that I conform, but the Lord changed me in my attitude towards how I should look. I don't dress out of anger or I don't dress just to prove a point. Yeah. So God transformed me and, and the call of God was when I read that Isaiah passage and then I realized God has called me. And you then, through the pastor at that time, and I guess through a series of different processes, you were then selected to that leadership role. Did you find that transition easy for Dominic because of your past? Or was it an easy slide into that position? You know, I was serving on staff since 1985. I became the lead pastor in 2005. So I've been there for a long, long time. Uh, of course, when I was told that I was the senior pastor designate, um, I told Pastor Naomi I needed two years. And the reason why I needed two years was because uh, I didn't want to assume the position immediately, uh, even though uh, I knew that God has equipped me. You see, God doesn't call the equip, but He equips those whom He calls. And I knew He was equipping me through that process. And I needed that two years just to ensure that God will continue to prepare me, clothe me, and equip me for the position I'm in today. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So, I mean, it, to me, uh, it's not a difficult transition. And I guess it's not difficult because I wasn't ambitious. I guess if you are ambitious, uh, you will come against a lot of hurdles. But I guess because I was allowing the Spirit of God to prepare me, to equip me. So it wasn't difficult. And, and Naomi and I had a, a easy change of baton. Yeah, so. Mm. You know, listening to your story, Dominic, it sounds like the love of God played a very important part in your life. Today, is it that same love of God that keeps you going? Yeah, many times. Uh, in fact, every couple of years, I would take a time off just to reflect on that journey. So walking down memories lane helps me recapture. And then when I think about what God has done in the current year, it all testify of God's love, God's call. Hmm. Dominic, I've got one final question for you. Today, as you mentioned earlier, Trinity is growing rapidly in Singapore. It's got about 10,000 people that attend. And I find it amazing that over 1,000 of those are lay leaders within the church. Now with the church and a leadership like that, and I hope I got this all right, you serve as the General Superintendent of the Assemblies of God in Singapore. You are the Secretary of the World Assemblies of God Fellowship, Chairman of the Asian Pacific Assemblies of God, and you sit on the Advisory Council of the Pentecostal World Conference. And so, among your peers, you've been recognized as a prophet with a strong apostolic calling. So let me ask you one final question. What do you believe today that God's Spirit is saying to the church? I believe God's Spirit is saying to the church today, don't be a potential, but be a fulfillment. You know, every church has a redemptive gift. Every church has a redemptive purpose. For too long, the church has just remained happy, contented, but we're never reaching our fulfillment. And I believe God is calling leaders, God is calling pastors to become leaders so that they can disciple the flock to help the flock step into their destiny. Because when every local church steps into their destiny, every local church will bring their redemptive gifts. So take for instance, the number of churches in Canada. If every Canadian church rise up to their redemptive purpose with the redemptive gift, then every gift that comes together becomes a beautiful picture of what that gift can do to transform Canada. So I believe that our church has a redemptive gift of leadership, and if we can rise in our leadership and come together in network with other churches in Singapore, we lend our gifts together and then we can transform Singapore. Dominic, Pastor, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>